this organisation has developed in a very different way than other, many other organisations, really principally a network of networks. In many respects, what would normally have happened if, with this kind of idea that Marius had, it would have appeared in a research paper and possibly, at the end of the day, a professional institution of some kind would have been formed. But I can bet your life that the people who had the experience of hearing voices wouldn't have been involved in that process very much. And I think that begins to give you a clue about how this thing works. It's both coming from the community, it's also allying itself to people within professions and services who are sympathetic and understanding and appreciate what we're saying. 1990, Manchester Hospital, patient Ron Coleman diagnoses schizophrenia, uh, life miserable and I remember at that time I got one of these new workers. They were called support workers. And one day she came up to me and said, there's a new group starting in Manchester called the Hearing Voices Group. Do you want to go? And I said, tell me about it. And she said, well, the idea is to get voice hearers together and you sit in a circle and you talk about your voices. And I looked at her and I said, don't be such bloody stupid woman. That is so unreal. I went to the group and I met Anne Walton. And Anne Walton said to me, do you hear voices? And I said, yes. And she said, they're real. For the first time in my life, someone acknowledged the reality of my experience. There were things we learned in the group. There were things we just did because it made sense. And that's what we need to learn from the past. In the past, nobody talked about hearing voices when we started in 87. Uh, they were called hallucinations. They were a symptom of an illness. And mostly it was called schizophrenia. Of course, still, some of it is still now, but that's how it started. There was no other way. Marius, you. No, that's true. What well, we learned that also because we learned most from this book, I must say, the recovery stories. You learn more from people who have been recovered than from people who are still in all the problems. In our group, we discuss about metaphors. We started by saying that voice hearing as a movement is itself a metaphor. But they also tell that in the past, and I was there too, it's a life, the people were told, it's a lifelong illness. You only could adapt to that illness. You shouldn't do anything about it. You could not do anything about it. You would not be able to build a career, neither to build a steady love story. That was the message what goes with the diagnosis of schizophrenia at the time, anyhow. Also the message was that you needed medication, lifelong medication, and you couldn't talk about the experience because you it would make people more chaotic. But what they didn't realize, if you start to talk about voices, people get emotional, but emotional doesn't mean chaotic. You have to help them to learn to cope with those emotions. My name is Rachel Wadding, I'm the manager of the London Hearing Voices Project. I've had unusual experiences since my childhood, um, but ended up in psychiatric services when I was about 18, when I went to university, completely overwhelmed with voices, the beliefs that I had an alien inside me, there was a conspiracy, and my life just collapsed ended up diagnosed with schizophrenia uh, on lots and lots of medication and kind of given the message that I was a no hope case, you know, the worst ever. There was no way I was ever going to live independently or get married or have a life. Um, and after a few years of that, of me becoming a complete shell, like a zombie, not even feeling like a human being, I met the Hearing Voices Network and went to a group. The group gave me my sense of self. They gave me this idea that I'm not just someone who's overwhelmed with things, that I've actually can contribute to the world. And they gave me this sense of hope. I think I'd had the life sort of squished out of me by psychiatry. So um, I, I didn't see myself as a human being at all, but I, what helped was seeing the other people as human first. Mm -hmm. And then once I recognised they were human beings and they heard voices, that allowed me then to recognise that they saw me as a human being too, but it was a really slow process. Well, I trained um, 
uh, as a psychiatric nurse in the UK and moved to Denmark, uh, trained as a psychotherapist there and been working in social psychiatry now for some 15 years. Started a, a small group um, for, for voice hearers in Denmark, which exploded almost in the space of a very short time. I think mostly through the need for something other than that which traditional psychiatry uh, has offered. My name's Adam Jugru, I'm a community nurse from Bradford. Uh, I've been coming to Intervoice since it started holding the World Congresses, so the last four years. It's become kind of an annual pilgrimage for me. Uh, I got involved with the movement about probably about eight years ago now. Uh, this is a real way of really made sense to me this way of working. I think I think uh, we have to be supporting people to have the information to make their own choices. Sometimes that means when you give them the information you have to help them create those realities. So uh, maybe help them to create safe spaces if those spaces don't exist or help them to tap into spaces that also exist. So I think I don't think there's any one way. I think there are many many ways of, of supporting people and uh, we should just embrace them all. question is, where do you want this movement to go over the next 25 years? How do you see Intervoice interacting with the, with the um, Hearing Voices movement? And what are the things that you're doing or want to do that you think are important in the, in the development of the next 25 years. I'm uh, very concerned with over-medication and with the fact that people are uh, dying of their drugs and I'm thinking also just our human rights, forced medication. We want our rights to have the treatment that we want or not. I'm setting up a support centre in my hometown and I'm going to try and bring about the philosophy of the Aaron Voices Network and it's experience driven and it's also science driven. Will and I would like to lead a workshop on uh, video and filmmaking. What I'd like to run a group on is education. Coping, coping with psychosis, psychosis coping strategies. <coughs> so people are interested in talking about how do we have these difficult conversations and move forward. I want to run a group on peer support. I'd like to do a workshop on the children when their mums or dads are took into hospital and they're left in care, how they have to be told why it's not their fault and how they go into self-blame. I'd like to do an open space on um, martial arts. Your left hand is your rock, so if you hold your left hand here and then your right hand is like water, like respect, compassion, and, so there, and then we do a bow to each other. Okay, and um, so if we could do that at the beginning and the end of when we do the elbow boxing and just be mindful of the curb and things like that. Uh, this is a little bit more um, dynamic. And the cars too, if someone's yeah. back. <laughs> okay, so find your own space. Yeah. <laughs> so I can block you. Oh. I was talking with a, I guess a nurse clinician earlier who was just start starting to reframe his experience um, based on the experiences he's having here at this conference. That's the kind of generative stuff that I'd like to see more often. And especially in mental health, if we've been drugged enough, we forget to ask questions, let alone remember that we were curious to begin with. I think it really is human rights work. It's, it's dignity and, and compassion and the rejoining of the human race the broad brushing of humanity for efficiency's sake is so detrimental to us. And if we can't take the time to get to know one another and become what pieces of community that we need, um, we're fading ourselves to a pretty tragic place. And it's not just the mental health minority. It's, it's our, our world stage that's getting smaller and smaller and less tolerant of itself all the time. <laughs> Um, 
Curtis C. Monday. Come on, Monday. Yes, those times that we cry, I can tell how you feel. There's nothing I smell. I fire for the air. Hi, this is Robin from the Netherlands. Uh, I'm a voice hearer, and you know what? It's not a symptom of mental illness. It's a human experience. It's worldwide from all ages. You just cycle. Stay strong. Believe in yourself if you hear voices. This is a pretty odd place. Is it? Oh, is it not good? I'm wondering if over there would be better. Let's go for it. <laughs> I thought you might be a double agent. <laughs> oh, we rolling? We're rolling. All right. All right. What are we, uh, what are you guys doing here? Well, we're, we're here at the World Hearing Voices Congress in Cardiff, Wales, and we are shooting a film called Healing Voices. The reason we came here is we want to talk about the Hearing Voices Network in, in this film because we feel like it's an, a really important development internationally. And this uh, idea and this work has been going on a long time in Europe. So now there's about 25 countries around the world who are a part of the network with similar philosophy. Basically that our experiences like hearing voices or having unusual beliefs or wild experiences are normal and that coming together and talking about those experiences with peers is powerful and leads to recovery, leads to wellness, leads to better outcomes. So we're, we're here to learn ourselves and to kind of incorporate that learning into, into the film. Um, do you want to say anything, PJ? Say so I believe that my voices are aspects of myself. I've been through a lot of trauma and as a child I didn't remember a lot of that trauma so I, my voices were there when I wasn't. It's like with any intense experience whether I mean if you've not heard voices then sort of like say grief or kind of a really intense situation when you're in it it's very hard to do anything with it but then at some point you'd be able to you're sometimes able to distance yourself and look at it from different angles tell different stories about it or kind of yeah, just have flexibility with it. And I guess what the Voices movement has given me is more flexibility. And, but the idea that there's not a model, and this is what I love about this, um, because if we tell people this is what you have to do and this is how you have to do it, we're just like psychiatry. Uh, my name is Rachel Waddingham. I hear voices, I have visions, and I have other sort of extreme states. So three years ago we had one hearing voices group that was quite small. And today we've got over 20 groups that have started up. We've trained close to a thousand people around the state of professionals, family members, voice hearers. And we're just getting increasing excitement of people wanting to, to learn about this approach. We're seeing people recover who were told they'd never recover. And it was very nice to have the 25 year anniversary. Yeah. And seeing that it's still growing and seeing that the voice hearers like it. And that we gradually get more and more interest of professionals, but the most important thing is that voice ears can profit and get back their own life. Because they, there's a freedom of mind to have voices to hear. <laughs> that is 4% or even more of the general population know that experience. And we call it a psychotic symptom that is on no basis. It's on the basis of not understanding and not listening, but not on the basis of knowing about the experience. And that is very important to people that the essential change is that its voices have a meaning, that they are in fact mostly helpful if understood. And should be talked about. Yeah. Uh, clinical psychiatry avoids to talk about the voice or to the voices. And it's important to talk to the voice because they have a message. Like we don't need to be always thinking about mental health in relationship to services. You know, in the old days it was like, and um, we always talked about the survivor movement. The survivor movement is about surviving psychiatry. Well, let's just just forget psychiatry to a large extent. Get you know, let them get on with it. And that's what Marius Rum says. He says that psychiatry will never change. 
partly by itself. It would only change in the face of um, a social and civil rights movement, and then it will change. And it did that with, that's why the reference to the gay movement, because the gay movement, you know, you know to, to be gay was a disorder. Um, it was in the DSM. Um, and it wasn't psychiatry that woke up one day and said, well, this is, this is clearly scientifically wrong. It was the fact of Stonewall, of the fact of a, a gay rights movement that changed the law, changed the way that society regarded people with, um, a, you know, a sexual variation, a variation in being. Um, and then they dumped it because it was no longer um, tenable to regard that as an issue. So, but though, you know, so I think we, we see the same thing here with voices. It, when society changes its mind about this way of thinking, where this way of being, so, you know, they are going to have to change. But we can't wait for them to do it. We have to do it for ourselves and then see them respond as a consequence of changing the way society thinks. I'm here today really to talk about cognitive therapy for voices and really to think about what the interface is between cognitive therapy and the hearing voices approach. I think most cognitive therapists would be very positive about the hearing voices movement and the work that they do and would endorse all the kind of work that goes on. Unfortunately, I've got to say, when I kind of go and talk to people in the hearing voices movement, I don't always pick up that same level of positivity about CBT from those who in the hearing voices movement. And I suppose I'm not quite sure what that's all about. It isn't just a question of attitude, but it's a question of uh, uh, maybe understanding and communicating with a person who lives in a different environment mm -hmm. than someone else. The biogenetic model can carry on as before and medication can continue and so on. So that is probably one of the reasons that uh, uh, we certainly are very skeptical in Denmark and we challenge it quite considerably. I think there are a lot of people who want the voice hearing movement to be more integral within traditional services so that people have better access to it. The problem is the culture we're in, that actually to get in there, as I mentioned in my, talk, my speech, you have to actually be evidence-based. And we have been pushing to try and get the hearing voices groups looked at as part of what should be in NICE guidelines. The problem is, because you don't want to conform to the tradition. There's not the research, there's not the RCTs. So we can't, it doesn't mean it doesn't work, it just means that the evidence isn't there to show it works. And you're probably doing a heck of a lot that cognitive therapists are doing. As I say, I think there's a big overlap. But because the evidence isn't there, it's not going to get in. And so cognitive therapists is some way there because it's conformed. And it has labelled those set of techniques but it means that it's within the system. The evidence is here. The evidence is amongst the people, and I think science gets in the way, and it looks up its own asshole too much. <laughs> and it needs to look at the people. Um, and it's the, the system with nice, though. Gets in the way. I want to say there is something more powerful than evidence-based. Mm -hmm. Human rights. Yeah. Human yeah. rights. Yeah. I think that's yes. an important piece that's missing. Because when I'm in the hearing voices movement, I feel like there's a recognition of psychiatric abuse and the harsh treatment and the trauma that I was experienced from the system, all of which is a human rights issue. To help people who hear voices, we really have to do things quite um, powerful things like uh, rituals or dramatically confront abusers from the past. Um, and it's all inspired by voices. So if we see them as uh, source monitoring deficits, we don't get that inspiration. Because in a way, the hearing voices approach isn't another treatment. It's a, it's a kind of emancipatory social movement. It, so so do we need an evidence base? Did the civil rights movement need an evidence base? Did the women's movement need an evidence base? Yes. The evidence, <laughs> the evidence of people's yeah. testimonies. And so, yeah, how do we work together? I agree. We sometimes have to play that game. And you're good at playing that game. So you're a great ally. Yeah. Um, and we don't want to you know, alienate you. <laughs> but at the same time, need to talk about these things, you know, like the, somehow the emotions get left behind and trying to control your thoughts when you've got a really powerful emotion. There's a lot of research now that suggests 
that that side possible. of the brain, the right hemisphere that's got all the more emotional side, the unconscious side, it doesn't really respond to the rational. <laughs> it, you know, it, it needs, you need to get your hands dirty, you need, need to uh, use puppets, <laughs> you, know, you need to do role plays, you need to use art, you need to, you need, and actually cognitive behavioral therapists aren't trained how to look after their own emotions to do that work, you know, as there would be some therapists who are very good at it, but a lot of them are actually trained to more control emotions rather than work with them. So I work with children that are struggling and these children aren't ill, they're not mad, they're not crazy, they've been through really difficult things, life has thrown difficult things at them and that we medicate, we sort of pathologise human experience I think is incredibly abusive. No one intends it to be abusive, no one in the mental health system wants to be abusive but I think the system itself is endemically really abusive and I think we do need to kind of, God, sound really cheesy but rise up. Um, not in an aggressive, let's kill the world kind of way, but in a way of showing people. I think if people knew this stuff, if like the person on the street knew this stuff, things would change because psychiatry wouldn't be forced into this very kind of keep the mad people away, please role. So yeah, I, what I want for Intervoice and for, for the community as a whole is to get out there and speak to people. Speak to people down the pub and the coffee shops and the community centres and just let them know about this, whether or not they hear voices, and bring the people into the movement who don't hear voices, so we work together. And I think there's so much to learn. I mean, it's interesting just the number of conversations I've had with taxi drivers to and from the conference um, about, you know, that, that people can function and have very creative, fulfilling, meaningful lives and still hear voices. And I think there's just so much stigma and so much prejudice and, and misunderstanding about voices out there. And I, I would love, you know, there to be a huge, this whole movement to take off and really to challenge public perceptions about voice hearing because there is so much prejudice out there. The achievements of the Hearing Voices movement remind us that freedom, justice and respect are modern words. They are perspectives. Perspectives can change the world.